Carson, Leno, Fallon. Now, it's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are at a way game day, way up in the Napa Valley, about to have a conversation with Julian Fayard. Introductions in just a moment. Wine Talks, of course, available on iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you hang out for podcasting. And this month is sponsored by Total Wine and Spirits. If you have a glass minute gift you need to make, you need a Cabernet for sis or a bourbon for dad, Total Wine and More has been doing this for 30 years, the cheapest prices in the industry. Have a, have a take a look at it. I found some amazing wines there not too long ago while, uh, while shopping around looking for some bourbon. So distilled spirits not available in Virginia or North Carolina. And B21 when you go to Total Wine and More. But not while we're here. We have a conversation with Julian Fayard. And I don't even know what to call you, Julian, but welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome. What it's... do you call yourself? Then, like chief bottle washer or something or what? Well, you know, I, I, I polish the tenants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a winemaker. Uh, you have a beautiful store we just walked into. Um, I mean, this is, and you're French. Yeah. You, you came to Napa Valley. I mean, we have a lot to talk about. Um, but you're telling you know, me where to start. <laughs> I didn't even know. Let's just start with your credentials because a master in winemaking, which all these years I'd not heard this uh, certification or degree. It's a master of winemaking from Toulouse. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a master in wine, which is the national classification for uh, analog, which is winemaker in France. Yeah, uh, it's an old school diploma. So my mom was a pharmacist, always wanted me to be a pharmacist. And I never went into pharmacy, but went into winemaking. But the funny story is that you do your final exam on pharmacy lab sheets because you have all the lab part. Oh, yeah, right. So she was proud of that part. At, at, at the University for Wine. Correct. We so there's something. five of them in France, and it's a national diploma, which is equivalent to a Master of Wine here. Uh, Louis, here's a story for your mom. You can tell her, because my father was a pharmacist. He had six stores. He had 12 at one time. I mean, he had 12 over time. And the last one he bought in 1969 had a wine shop associated with it. And then he found out that everybody that came in the pharmacy was hurting and ailing. Everybody came in the liquor store and the wine shop were like, hey, let's have a party. So he sold all the pharmacies. <laughs> <laughs> so he would have ended up here anyway. <laughs> no, but the, the history of wine and pharmacy has been uh, rooted to the hip. Yes. Uh, mostly because of the analysis part and the chemical part. Do you understand the product? Yes. And so even though we strive to make wine that are, you know, less intervention, we use a lot of chemistry to understand. Right, of course. Uh, from grape growing all the way to bottling. Well, that's an interesting thought uh, since we're on that subject. You know, the Burgundians in the 12th century didn't have this information. The Bordelais didn't have this information. The, and we use it today. And you've been to school, you got your master's. What did they use? What what guided these, not I'm going to say ancient, but early winemakers? Yes, um, uh, trial and error. Yeah, I, well, I suppose. <laughs> and generations of it. Um, I think nowadays we make a lot of uh, more um, quality wines. There is less waste. Yes. And I think it's due for a better understanding of the material. We still use techniques that have been developed 200 years ago. And when I was in Bordeaux, in Poyac, uh, especially in Lafitte, the whole demonstration of the, my thesis was to basically try to redemonstrate that the technique traditionally used are the good ones. And every time you differ from it, you always come back to it. It's but very isn't interesting. That, isn't that fascinating? Isn't that interesting that it really is the same thing? Uh, we have refined methodologies and we try to craft something around you know, better filtration or finding or whatever we're doing. Yeah. So I think in difficult years, we can make better wines yeah. because we have ways to adjust and compensate what the weather is taking away from us. But uh, the, the the bottom line is not changing. And I think the product does not change, which is, a you know, it's very simple. The ingredient is grapes. It's fermented grape juice. Exactly. Because I think about things like optical sorters. Yes. And then I, I, I it came to me. Aren't these optical sorters? <laughs> exactly, and and it's all it is. It's a machine that can see faster than yeah, right. keep know, the lizards from going. Yeah, Steve Jobs was like the computer is the bicycle of the mind. Right, that's the right. The optical sorter is equivalent to a crew of forty or fifty people. It's pretty interesting. It's, yeah, it's and so yes, but 
the job being done is the same one. But you know, it's interesting about that because in some cases, it seems like, let's just talk about organic farming for a second. We're going back to what it was anyway. In other words, we created all these pesticides and the Bordelais invented copper sulfate. And then now we're going back to like proud of ourselves for removing this stuff from the process. From the process. And I think it's, it's an, an ongoing research. For me, I have a little pet peeve against um, forgetting 60 years of chemistry. At yes. the same time, we, we start to understand um, what has been wrong with it and the accumulation of the soil and, uh, you know, all the water, all, all the secondary effects. Uh, and I think we have to be aware of it. But at the same time, I think there is a compromise somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, genetics, you know, we have better plants that are stronger. And that's how they created Cabernet Sauvignon. It was Cabernet Franc, you know, crossed Sauvignon with Blanc, Sauvignon yeah. Blanc because it has a stronger skin, a better resistance to rot. And that was, you know, empirical mix of pollen. Uh, now we can do it in a lab with a DNA control. I th you know, that's an interesting thought because uh, when I mentioned that to customers at the time or at a wine tasting that Cabernet, which is, you know, the noblest of all red wines and, you know, at least worldwide, considered that that it's a hybrid. It oh, kind of yes. kind of deflates some people. Like, oh, I thought it was some kind of ancient grape, you know, that, that we've been making wine from, but it's not. No, it was in the effort to um, make Cabernet Franc stronger uh, to rot and to difficult years. So sometimes in California and people in the U.S., we're used to ripe weather. Yes. You know, we're fighting ripeness, actually. Um, in Europe, you're, f you're trying to be ripe. You're fighting the weather, the rain, the rot. I mean, those crops are decimated yeah. uh, by hail. Um, so it, it's an, it was a different process. You know, so you have a master's in agribusiness, which is, what would be the focus of, so you got your master's in winemaking from Toulouse and then the ma Toulouse master of agribusiness, which I've not heard that degree, is that? study of agriculture, but the business side, or is it a little so bit it's, of both? It's an engineering level mm -hmm. uh, degree, and it ranges from people that will run farms, uh, food plants, transformation, all the way to the banking industry. We have people that have been in space research. I mean, it, it's basically you're an ag major mm -hmm. uh, with a focus on business and also uh, crop, animal production. Uh, very, very wide. So kind of the wine is a focus, a sub-focus of that. Actually, the way you finish those diplomas is you pair with someone and one goes to one school, the other one goes to the other school and at night you trade your notes. Really? Interesting. Yeah, it's a little bit of work. And where was this at? It's in France, so in Toulouse France. and Angers. So this kind of leads to that, to, you made a comment about the DNA and the, the pollinization of, of the hybrid Cabernet Sauvignon. And I had this conversation with a, um, a gentleman that created a, uh, in the lab, he created a uh, genetically modified beverage to avoid hangovers. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but the next day I had a conversation with a gentleman who's doing organic distilled spirits. And the question I asked them both was, how can, how, what is the difference when it's all said and done? If you created Cabernet Sauvignon because of cross-pollinization or as a basic, you know, plant hybrid versus creating that same hybrid in the lab with the GMO. Yeah. Does, do you get the same product or does GMO do something that we don't understand yet? Or are we... Yeah, so there is, I mean, there's an ethic part where you cross the animal kingdom with the plant yeah, realm. Right. And that's a big, big ethical question. Um, and then after there is things that naturally you will not be able to do uh, through pollinization that you can do in the lab. So that's another ethical problem. So it's really a, a, a term of how much do we want to screw with nature? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, we know it can fire back. Um, we understand mechanism, we can develop different plants. Um, for me, I'm always on the, let's follow what's natural and maybe have sharper tools or precise tools. So it'll save time, improve research. Uh, but then there's also the ethical question that I think we have very good scientists that are able to ask them before starting an industry of it. Well, I haven't tried this uh, anti-hangover thing yet, only because it was GMO and I wasn't <laughs> sure. 
but I always wondered because, you know, we're talking about organic farming now, we're talking about biodynamic farming where, you know, you got to, it takes three years at least to clear the soil of its yes. problems. And, you know, they accuse the American farming system of butchering uh, the fields and, you know, make them, making them unusable almost to a certain extent. Is France more, um, not particular, but more aware of these kinds of issues coming up? Uh, those issues are the same. Uh, I think agricultural farming in the U.S. is more an extensive uh, farming. So if you look at number of acres per cow of grazing, mm -hmm. it's a lot more ten tenfold what is used. So Europe is more intensive. Yes. It's also because we have less land there than right, there is sure. here. But at the same time, you have the problem of the hormones and feedlots, which are not in Europe. And yeah, it's, right. uh, so the hormones help you know, grow different cow faster, more effectively. So it's all questions of how industries have been organized, uh, the effect on the population, mm -hmm. the nutrition, mm -hmm. and and then the economical reality of it. Um, it's interesting, but a farmer in the U.S. and a farmer in France earns about the same. Really? Wow. Yes, in the end. The two you different know, governments, the two different structures. The two yeah, different... I, I, I spent a little time in Wyoming, and it was interesting to really? see. <laughs> yeah, out of any place. But that's where ag brings you. Um, but it's pretty interesting when you see the day-to-day -day life of those people. Yeah. Um, the, the realities are not that different. And you can take a surgeon. It's about the same story. Um, in the end, our societies are different yet organized the same way. And so I think the bottom line always comes to relatively the same thing. Well, you know, and we're going to get to you here in a second, but I'm having an interesting time with some of this conversation. And I think that one of the notes I wrote before I showed up was about the new world versus the old world. I mean, I, I look at France or Europe in general and say, wow, how cool they protect their cheese, how cool they protect their butter, how cool they protect their wine at the same time. And that's maybe why you're here, America or anything new world, so to speak, I'm talking about political new world and, uh, you know, what's the environment of the new world, not necessarily a character, but the fact that you can do whatever you want. Yes. Look at your brand new store. You've got a myriad of wines here that you've had a lot to do with. And one of your farmers just came in that you had a chance to greet, um, but they can do whatever they want out there. Is that what brought you here? I think so. Um, that's a good question. The reason is I came, I came in 2000 and then I came back in 2003. And what I saw in Napa was that the wine industry was young and then it was following the same steps or the same mechanics of construction that are in Europe. And people choose their wine because they have a preference and you collect your wines and you drink on a certain night certain wines and you drink with friends a different wine. And that's the same behavior. And the industry is organized differently, but it follows the same steps. Um, you you have a wine store, you have a wine distributor, you have you know, uh, and but I saw a younger a younger industry mm -hmm. uh, with a lot to discover and build. And after spending you know a little more than fifteen years here, almost twenty, um, the the what what happened? I think even COVID accelerated that a little bit. It's I think the American culture as a whole. Is turning and uh, is becoming the old world, mm -hmm. and you have an uh, you know the amount of cheese you can find. You go in Sonoma, just in the county of Sonoma, and the number of cheese uh, plant or people, the, the variety. Uh, the other day, I did a tasting for some people that were sensitive to cow milk, so we did only goat, mm -hmm. and it was like seven different goat from Here? California. Yes. In California. In California. <laughs> and so the, the the amount of choice and the amount of quality also, yes. because it's a good product, the good product only develops if there is quality. I mean, that's a basic rule. People will buy it again if they like it. Right. But you didn't find that even 10, 12 years ago. No. Um, people eat out. Terraces, you know, forcing people out of the restaurants, spend time on the terrace, enjoying the day. I mean, that was a COVID thing. Yes, right. But, uh, you know, People don't go back to, no. they, they enjoy their time. And um, I like to say, you know, American always ate bread, used to be Wonder Bread, and now it's baguette. Oh, my God. And it used to be cheddar, <laughs> and there was sharp cheddar and yeah, right. fresh cheddar. Tillamook and whatever. Exactly. Now you have, you know, you, you'll find like 40, 50 different cheeses. Um, so I think, and you you see the just the level of food. I mean, California 
and Napa especially were very lucky. Mm -hmm. But I've traveled throughout the U.S. and the bar has been raised in terms of food. And even you go from a food truck all the way to a high-end table. Um, and the Americans are getting more educated, more refined. The wine goes along with that. You know, it's like you have good food, you start research your food, um, you start to research your wines and you start to pair them. Um, what was that? 15 years ago, I visited Budweiser, the plant in St. Louis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I had the chance to do it with the head brewmaster. Just really? Like little, just him and wow. I. And I asked him, I said, what's the bud recipe? It's like almost like the Coke recipe. It's like, yeah. what is the recipe? And it's like, what's well, ever changing? And they're always changing. And they're actually adding more hop, removing rice, making it slightly more bitter. Because the palate of the average American consumer is eating less sugary, mm -hmm. is eating more fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's a monster, you know. That's Budweiser. interesting that they would do that. that well, they, they would... observe people consumption behavior and they tune with it and they tune it as a national level. And so it was pretty exciting to see. And so in the winemaking, I anticipate that as well. So we, we work with wine that have a little less alcohol. So, you know, there was last 40 years, the way they, especially Napa became about is a research for power and concentration. And that led with high alcohol wine, was mm -hmm. a huge structure, massive bodybuilding. I mean, and I taste stuff from the 40s and the 50s that still, you know, come. I mean, they had those structure, less alcohol, but you see in the riper years, you see the note from Chili Chef, right, stuff like that. Right, it's right. pretty interesting. Uh, and those wines are age worthy, they're classic California. But in terms of drinkability, you know, after the first bottle, it started to hit a wall. So yeah, right. now there's there's a slight trend. It's not just slight. It's a, there's a trend towards a little bit of less alcohol, a little more freshness, more fruitiness, more aromatics, more nose. And so that goes through a lot of winemaking techniques to preserve that, but also in the farming. The farming side is huge. So um, you're not you're not removing alcohol. You're just keeping the no. You pick a little production. early. Yes, you adjust. Um, but it's it's less sugar in the grape. One, so one example is, in just in farming, uh, there was an optimization of canopy exposure to sunlight, mm -hmm. which helped basically produce more sugar. But now we have a couple of vineyards that have like challenged canopy that don't have the most optimal row orientation. But what happened is they produce sugar a little less. You pick a little later, you have mm -hmm. more hang time, mm -hmm. you have a little less sugar content. But still ripe. But you can bring it to ripeness. Yeah. You, know, you have a little estate in Coombsville. I don't have sun after 3 p.m. I have to pick in late October. But the wines are complete, fully ripe wow. at 14% alcohol. So there is ways to plant. There is ways to naturally do it in the farming. But you see, you you saw this market for low alcohol wines or lower alcohol. What, what like for instance, this uh, Levant Julien Le Blanc. Uh, Le Blanc Light. Um, yeah, so, so that, what, what is that, 11% then or something? Yeah, that's it's actually a category in the TTB, in the alcohol, it is. yes, uh, which is a, called light wine, which is any wine between 8 and 11% alcohol. I see. And it, it's the, similar to when you have a beer with less alcohol. Right. Um, I mean, if you look at it, it has the Bud Light and Coors Light car. <laughs> <laughs> but, just don't mark it like a Bud Light. Well, th that's, that's kind of what I wanted is, I mean, if you taste it, it's very aromatic. Yeah, it's good freshness, way. but at the same time, it's it's a wine. Certainly, the nose is there. Oh yeah, right? it's a fully complete wine. It's just we didn't take it away from it. We just picked it lighter. We use a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. aromatic varietals to it, so they'll bring a little more it's nose, gorgeous. more texture. Yes, it's a fun wine to drink, and you can have lunch and still go back to work. Acid's there too. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, let's talk about um, you know your your trek here to to America to do that. You like you're from the Provence, so you know, you're a rosé guy. Mm -hmm. However, the Provence is growing lots of things now, right? They're doing all, in particular, they're pretty big on organic and biodynamic farming. You know, uh, what's yep. his name? Um, oh, yeah, Chaboutier, for yeah, example, Chaboutier. and the Rhone. Yes. Gerard. Anyway. Well, uh, my, my uncle, Chateau Saint Marguerite, is the largest organic producer there. Oh, is he? Wow. Yeah, and that was a choice, a conscious choice that was made 20 years ago to switch to organic, 100%. Um, 
And at the beginning, people, I see it now here because we're getting rid of glyphosate. Yes. It's been, it's been a long journey, but we're getting there. But it takes the farming companies to change their way of working and the way they organize. So they need more tractor drivers, more equipment. It takes, um, it's more expensive. Well, it's, it's more expensive, but it's expensive differently. Yeah. And I think the consequences of glyphosate, you don't want to see the price of that. Well, you know, they say, that, right, organic farming takes more people, takes more attention, biodynamic even more. But then again, you're saving on pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides, which yeah. are expensive. My bottom line is going to cost you to farm. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's sometimes trying to be too efficient, uh, leads to long-term losses. Um, and I, I think, you know, the tractors, there is all the generation of electrical tractors coming. There is so many changes there. And in terms of cost and efficiency, we have tractors that are less complex, mm -hmm. are easier to drive, that you can drive faster. Uh, so there is, there will be a natural balance. So interesting. So when you, you, you went to, you're in the Provence, you, you worked at Lafitte, which like, you know, you, you can't pick much more pedigree than that. Uh, to to practice, where the, where else did you make wine? Uh, a little bit in the Loire Valley when I was up there. Loire, okay, great. Uh, next to Angers, in in a little bit of Chenin and Cabernet Franc. Yeah. Uh, then Bordeaux, I went around Bordeaux quite a bit. Provence, that's where I started. Yeah. Uh, and then the U.S. And then the U.S. So, when you when you come to Napa Valley, and this is you know it's pretty young. Uh, I think I wrote in some notes that Michel Roland had told a friend of mine who makes wine in Armenia, you know, it's going to be a hundred years before you figure out what's going on here. And if you think about Napa Valley, it's been around for a long time, but really the education of the current winemakers have started like in the seventies. Or we got a little bit of time to go. Yeah. You and I won't be, it won't be done when I'm done. No, <laughs> so you're just passing through. So what was it so interesting to you about Napa that you would leave, you know, pretty comfortable surroundings in France and your hometown, your home language to come to America and try something completely new. Yeah, I think there was the potential for growth because uh, it's really an expanding, even though there's changes in consumption and so forth, but I think wine is an expanding segment mm -hmm. in the American consumption. Um, when you compare the per capita consumption, I think you have a huge huge capital and then you add Asia to that and right, yeah, yeah, more. Right. I mean it's it's so I think in terms of an industry it's pretty safe. Um it's still an industry that is scary, you know, it's alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, all that stuff. Don't tell me about it. Um but <laughs> but it's I think I mean prohibition showed that you can't take it away from people. No. <laughs> and it's I think it's just became the anniversary, but it, it's a social experiment that Yeah today. Yeah, it's December fifth. Today's the repeal day. How about yeah. that? Happy so, repeal day. Happy okay, repeal day. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Um, Nineteen thirty-three. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's it's a crazy experiment. But it, 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 one of the biggest takeaways was you can't take alcohol out of the society. No, and our societies. Well, you know, they just they they unearthed an Armenian winery, six thousand year old. We I went and visited the place. It's incredible. They've got the whole the whole process is right in front of you and it's six thousand years old. I, I had this very romantic view of wine that that that's not gonna go anywhere, of course. And the ebbs and flows of consumption are just generation changes. Correct. Eventually somebody has that proper glass of wine and they go, Oh, okay, I understand what this is about. That's that's my romantic view of this. But we have to deal with the current trends. We have to deal with Yes. You know, if and you're coming to Napa, this is not an inexpensive place to grow. At all. And and that's what I was saying earlier is there is changes in consumption. And so you have to adjust. Luckily, enough people trust me to make their wines so that I don't have to compromise. Yeah. So I can take one estate and take it in one direction and then take another estate and take it in another direction and see a little bit what's more relevant. What happens is you always find an audience you always find people that really cater to your style. I mean, it's it's an emotion thing. So, yeah, um, people will enjoy your wines and will be for whatever reason. Uh, it might be taste, might be an emotion of meeting people and spending a good time. Mm -hmm. But for me, the as long as wine becomes part of your household, and when you go to the store and you pick up some wine, you're, you know, it's it's 
part of, it's like when you do your groceries, you know, it's what you're going to put in your fridge. Uh, it's part of your household. It's part of your identity. Uh, it's part of your everyday living. And so when you become part of that, I think it's special uh, because you won't let in things that you don't like. I mean, you have that purchasing choice of power. That's true. Um, and so when people decide to be like, oh, this is going to be my Tuesday wine, for me, my job's done as a winemaker. How do they find you to 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 have that conversation about? I'm, I have this plot of land or I'm buying grapes from, let's say, the couple that was down there. And they say, you know, Julian, I want you to make these and here's what I think it should be. How do they, fig how do they figure this out? Uh, it's conversation. I think uh, that I actually open to each project because I want the people to be, I mean, you know, the farmers have an ideal, you know, they farm for a certain reason. So some farm for volume, some farm for quality. Mm -hmm. uh, there is always a pride in your fruit um, and where it goes and what we do with it. So that's the first step is the farmers are, you know, it's are in line with, I mean, my mm -hmm. expectation, mm -hmm. their expectation, we're all working in the same direction. So when there is hard decision to take, we can... I mean, sometimes, you know, you have to replant a block or you have to events millions of dollars. It's not so you have to be aligned on what you're going to do to get there. Um, and then in terms of making the wines, for me, it's always what the site is about. I think that drives 60, 70% of the question. There is my touch and my opinion, which I think. Which nobody cares about, but that's okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> and then there's also what the ownership. I think. own this thing. I want to do it my way. <laughs> the ownership, I think, needs to be part of it because um, they're going to be there standing, representing their wines, and they need to be proud of what they have. It's not, oh, this guy made it, so it tastes like that. It's, uh, you know, and there's a couple of winemakers like that where ownership has zero say. Yeah, well. Um, for me, it's like some people have visions and they have, a certain opinion and it's my role if it's not in line or if it requires too much of a, you know, I mean, if, you, if, you, if I came to you, I don't know, what is, what's good Cabernet? 10,000 a ton? 8,000 a ton? Oh, 8,000 is cheap. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that automatically equates to, you know, $80 a bottle at 8,000, $100 a bottle for 10,000. I mean, you, we're not going to be able to just walk into this industry. I mean, let's face it, this is a tough tough bracket and, and if you're already spending that kind of money for for grapes what you get in the bottle you got a market at 150 dollars a bottle i mean this is tough do you do you bring so that, that to the table when you yes i mean that's that's my i think it's part of my role to to give them a, you know benchmark of are, are we in the benchmark? are you sure you want to do this yeah you're not going to make a 11 percent cabernet sauvignon no. At that you're gonna sell 250 bucks. No. Yeah, you'll have five people that will buy it one day, and right, they'll it. call you after. I might throw the ball at you. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I think it's important in that part. I mean, you you mentioning prices. It's an extremely expensive business. Uh, you take a lot of risk, and it takes about five years for a ball to bring the money back. Yeah. You know, it takes Minimum. about three years to finish it, age it, and by the time you're in the market and deliver five years so you have to build five years of inventory with the growth and you, and you have like well, i just got done earlier this morning with a podcast well-established brand in the, in the napa valley been here forever and they were hired they uh, they had friends who one of their friends is a consulting analogist and the owner is saying why don't i have a hundred points and I got to sell the wine for three hundred fifty dollars a bottle, and I can't sell unless I got hundred points. And then the consulting knowledge is saying, "Well, you can't sell for three hundred fifty dollars, you know, until you get your hundred point score." And does it really matter once you get a hundred point score? No, it it's, it it matters. It doesn't matter. Um, it it helps tremendously. Take a break from our conversation with Julian Fayard to talk about the original Wine of the Month Club, curating fine wine since nineteen seventy two. It's the original Wine of the Month Club. For the novice on your list or the experienced connoisseur, the Wine of the Month Club has a club for you. Go to www.wineofthemonthclub.com, that's wineofthemonthclub.com, and use the promo code PAULK, P-A-U-L-K, 
for 10% off your first order. That's the original Wine and Milk Club. Back to the show. Um, it still does. It's Yes, it's less and less relevant because I think uh, the counter side of the, the 100 points is um, the consumer knowledge. Well, the consumer trusts in themselves to appreciate wine. Yes. And say, okay, I'm paying this much for the bottle. It's worth it. Um, what happened with the 100 points, what happened with some brands like that, it's the collectability. And so it becomes, a, a, a you know, that's where the wine between, it, it switched world between that consumption uh, part of the table food product to a collectible product. Right. And that collectible product, um, for me, it's the resale value. So that 350 bucks, the, the winer might never see it. That might be the market value. Yeah, right. The winer didn't sell it for that. Exactly. Okay, and, so. and when your resale value outweighs your re, um, release value, you have a brand. And that, t that takes years to build. Yeah, if you can even get there. Exactly. So that's a really interesting thought because you have a new store, which is gorgeous, by the way, in your tasting bar. And your thought process is you're going to have... Um, uh, buyers of wine bottles and they can taste wine too, but primarily it's a wine shop. Is yes. Okay. Yeah. So do you have those two groups? I was, I was trying to peel this back earlier today. There, there is that collectible group and I, and I don't, I'm not aware of it because I was selling wines at 15 to $20. That was my specialty. I did it for 35 years. We those guys drink it every day. Yes. Right. But, um, during COVID I could sell anything I wanted to. So I started collecting stuff, Grand Cru Burgundy, Classified Growth Bordeaux, Oddball, Rihaus, whatever. And, and the buyer of the company didn't want them. So now I have all these wines I got to store. And I started thinking about this idea. I put it in my cellar at home and I'm like, God, do I really want to open this Grand Cru? It's like $400. And if I drink it, then I'm not going to have it anymore. Yep. Right. And that's the thought process behind a collector versus somebody who's just wants to enjoy a good glass of wine. You just wait a little bit and then you're going to forget about the price yeah. and you will drink it. <laughs> you're just going to drink it. That's the danger of the wine cellar. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I told my wife we could have a bottle every night for the next like 15 years. We're probably still not going to run yeah. out. Um, I see, I see, I, that, uh, there's a, I mean, it's an expensive proposal, but what you do is you buy two, you drink one, and sell the <laughs> okay, other. Good. Thanks. You know, it used to be the rule when we started collecting wine in France, yeah. like you buy three six pack right. and you sell two, you buy, you drink one. Because I think in the end, if you're passionate about wine, you want to drink it. Then you want to know what's in that bottle and how it's aging. Oh, and, I do. And you want to share it with people. So, and that's, I think that's the magic of wine is that it's a cultural experiment. It's a, it's a, it's a social uh, gathering it it's, is. and it has that component um, of education and knowledge and sharing. You know this this uh, the, the this woman from Bordeaux I was talking about. She said the most profound thing to me, and I didn't even think about it when she said, "Good to see you again." And I hadn't seen her since 1993. And we started talking about what you're talking about now, which will peel back a little more. We started talking about this cultural value of a glass of wine and the friendship that it built. She goes, look what it did to you and me. It brought us together back, you know, 30 yep. years later. And I'm like, wow, you're right. Mm -hmm. That's that's the connection. And wine does that. And uh, that and I, memory, you know, that memory when you come and visit the winery, when you have that evening with friends, you remember them. And that memory lasts. And every time you go in your wine cellar or you go in a store and you buy that wine again, like I... I love uh, um, Alto VS, yes. you know, from Spain. And be, but that's a moment with some of my dear friends right. 20 years ago that we discovered and went to Spain. I mean, I love the wine, that's but beautiful. I also love the memories it yeah, brings. Yeah, of course. Me. Well, this is why I think this store is in today's marketplace. And I, because I was a fighting internet sales guy, I mean, I sent 33 million emails in 2022. Okay, so we, you know, we did a lot of this, <laughs> and I got an ad yesterday from my own company, running by the new people, which was uh, you can buy a case of wine for one hundred and twenty dollars, a ten dollar bottle of case, and then the next ad I got on Facebook was from a competitor called Cheapo Vino, 
and it was sixty nine dollars for the same for a twelve bottle case. Someone's losing and money. So they're in there slugging it out, trying to figure out who's going to be cheaper. Yeah. What you have here is that experience. Somebody they're walking downtown Napa, and they come into the shop and they go, "How pretty!" And they sit down, have a glass of wine, and they buy some wines. Forever and a day, they're going to remember that experience. Yes, and for me, it was an answer to two questions. The first one is, I have a lot of small estate. You know, regulation-wise, it's very hard to build wineries and mm -hmm. have visitors mm -hmm. in the valley. So it allows them to have a space that they can use. Uh, and it's also a window for people to be able... I, uh, one question I get is, where can I find your wines? So you can come here and you'll have everyone. And that allows people to browse and choose. And we have everything from Sonoma Coast all the way to the Sierra Foothills. Uh, and it's it's an interesting, a d different dynamic, and and that allows people to discover that space. You know, it's funny uh, for the listeners that, that are listening to this episode. They should know that it is very difficult, and you would expect that in the Napa Valley, that getting licensing and building a winery would be uh, would face so many headwinds, but it's very challenging. Yes, a lot of it has to do with uh, conservation of the land, and you know, uh, it, it's uh, done for uh, some good reasons. Yeah, you know, and overdevelopment and protection of the land, and uh, there's justified reasons for it. And but it it drives the price of the wine up as well, scarcity. That's of course, and it, you know that's the Levin Julien you mentioned. That that's for me a new foray into bringing. So it's mostly California wines throughout throughout California. But it was a way to bring people wines from regions with a certain level of crafting at a price point below 50 bucks. And that's, that's not easy to do. Yeah, because in Napa, I mean, unless we do a red wine, it's really challenging to bid those prices. It's almost impossible. It is almost impossible. Um, yeah. Then I'm fighting also, it's, I think our entry level wines should be a lot better. And that's a, that's a comment of, would you California yeah. and America in general. Would you say that the Burgundians as well? Because entry-level Burgundy, at least in America, isn't very good. <laughs> there are some good ones. Yes. But, <laughs> but I mean, people don't know what they're getting, and they think they are getting the real yeah, deal, right. but it's like you, 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 yeah, you get what you pay for. You, you, you mentioned uh, one of the articles I read about you about the terroir expression of wine, which I think is an important um opinion and comment for American wines, because Napa, you probably have to agree with me that Napa has landed on this opulent fruit forward, less structure, less less acid, less backbone kind of wine. Uh, all the big brands that, that are you see in the markets that are could be over $100 sort of have this character. And that it's, is a big difference between the new world and the old world is sort of the terroir expression and the knowledge built over all these years. Yes. And so how, how are you doing that here? So you're assuming that those over opulent, you know, style one drives a certain style, which is man-made. Right. Exactly. But man is part of the terroir. Right. That's true. It's I I believe terroir is all about uh, Julian's, you know, ex, uh, so experience. So th there is an interconnection. So if you take it the European way with the AVA, it became to a point where the AVA was driving the style so much. We even had committee that will reject your wines if they didn't fit a certain style. Hmm. And so the industry was ju ju judging the industry, but it was driving a style. So people that didn't want it to be in that style will lose the AVA. And I mean, happened to my cousins where he did, really? he did a Viognier and no in one the wanted the Viognier in Provence, but he has one of the most expensive Viognier in Provence uh, because there is a follow -up. There is a craft, there is a justification why it's better. Yeah. But the Côte de Provence wants nothing to do with it. So, wow. And uh, I mean, Chateau Palmer, you know, yeah. it, they do the Cuvée du Centenaire, which, you know, it's uh, reminiscent to the eras when they added Syrah to yes. the land. Right. And it's a beautiful bottle of wine, but it loses the AVA. Chateau Margot does a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, you're not allowed to have Sauvignon Blanc in Margot. So it doesn't wow. carry. The Margot Appellation. Yeah, right. So it's just things like this where you can always limit yourself, but you will have people that step outside the envelope. I think anytime you create a boundary, actually, some people will step out of it. Uh, and so your know, question about terroir for me is an ever-changing picture. And it's also a response to what drives the industry. Mm -hmm. And the, the industry has been driven by Parker. 
uh, that, by Mondavi, yeah, I agree. By Gallo, all those people drove the taste. They control what goes in the market, and they gave. American people and the world what it should taste like, mm-hmm. which has been a great way to establish a certain guide of this, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, we were changing and we're like, okay, maybe there's something different. Maybe we, we can do it differently. And so there is a new establishment. I think um, the critics are not as powerful. The scores are not as powerful, but people will find certain critics and read and attach themselves to that person or that person because they feel they're more in tune with their palate. Uh, so that's the consumer starting to judge and drive the industry. I think that's really important because I, I was with James Suckling at a port tasting uh, not too long ago. And I said, I want you to come on my show, which he hasn't done yet. He committed to, to defend the point structure. Yeah. And to defend the idea, he's got seven, eight, ten p- tasters, and they're all supposed to be on the same page. And you know how difficult that is. But and here's my argument for point structure. And I guess you, in your opinion, I was right on, and that you have to find one that seems to be aligned with your palate. Yep. But I, I tasted a wine not too long ago. Uh, it was it was 95 points. Um, and I can't remember the small island. It wasn't Malta, and it wasn't Sardinia, but it was one of these islands. And the wine was incredible. But it, Total departure from a 95 point Napa wine. Yes. And so if I'm a point buyer, I want 95 points, but I taste this, you know, volcanic ash, you know, uh, Sangiovese, I'm not, I may not like well, it. T- tell me why there is no rose above 91 point. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, there's just, some gorgeous, uh, some, uh, some gorgeous <laughs> stuff. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I mean, what do you rate and what does it mean? And I think a 95 Napa is a 95 Napa and a 95 Bergen is a 95 Bergen. It, right. it tells two right. different story. That's true. And you don't want one to resemble the other right. either. No. That would be a sad. The, the last part I think is we see a lot of cross investment, you know, a lot of European companies investing in Napa. Mm-hmm. A couple guys here have been. And so what I see is also an industry that is changing in terms of ownership. And that's going to bring, I think, a different layer on how the industry is structured, what the technical discussions, the stylistic discussions are about. And you have people that are, you know, I mean, you have Moix, you know, the, the, I mean, the Latour, you know, all those guys have huge, huge power uh, and they have power internationally. Yeah in the distribution network. And so if they start to drive certain, I mean, look at Opus One with the cooperation of Mouton, um, they drive a certain style and they drive it internationally. So that's, they are a representation of Napa Valley in the world. So when people buy a bottle of Napa, mm-hmm. it's through their links and what they think the style should be. And so they educates the whole market about a certain style of wine from us. And so. I agree with that. <sighs> There's an interesting problem building, in my opinion, and that's two things. The consolidation of wholesale distribution network, mm-hmm. which is, you know, creating Southern Wines and Spirits book is this thick, and now our NDC is that thick as well. Uh, coupled with things like Dow selling for $900 million to Treasury Wine Estates. And so these large organizations are taking over these brands. And we, I told you I had a conversation with Ludovic uh, Dervant at... Um, at Stag's Leap. And one of the questions I always ask those folks, and it leads to a question for you, is are you autonomous in making what you ex- want to express from Stag's Leap or from wherever that? And that's an important thing. Uh, the other one the interview I did with Boilo Vineyards, I mean, you know, Andre Chelyshev stuff. And how is it that he can navigate corporate America? along with trying to maintain this brand. So the question is, how do you manage brand value? How do you manage the idea that you've got this brand that has a certain level of character versus what's been given to you by the vineyard for that in expressing terroir? How do you, is that just the uh, No, that, that's, that's a huge challenge. I mean, when, when you're absorbed uh, by a corporate world, um, you might lose the soul. And if you lose the soul, you will lose the brand. Right. Because in the end is the consumer. And when there is that aggregation of brands, the the fight for space and attention at the consumer level is the same. It doesn't matter you're in two different books or you're in the same books. Right. Internally, distribu- distributors have the same problem of, if I spend more work working on my brand, 
I'm going to push some of their brand off the shelf. <laughs> so it's cannibalization naturally. In the end, uh, you know, it, you have to fight. I think the right fight is for the consumer. That's what I'm yes. saying. Like when someone buys the wine, drink it at home on a bad day and goes back and buy another bottle. Right. That's when you're, you're branding there. That's it. it that's, that's tough. That return consumer, return buyer, because he appreciated the wine because it's part of his household. That's, that's value. That's a brand. Um, it's the season ticket guy that follows his team, you know, I like that. And, and, but that's what it is. And that's how you breed brand. And if you lose, if you change the style, that guy is going to go back and be like, whoops, something changed. And then he's going to read that, get absorbed. And he's like, oh, now this is a corporate thing. And he's going to move slightly away and you're going to lose those consumers. So when some, the thing, the counter argument to it is some of those big groups are actually, I mean, you take LVMH, they're really good at keeping identity in each brand. Yeah. And they're really good at keeping a full cohesive, even though they're a corporate, they have a cohesive structure and they, they keep the identity of those brands and they keep develop them. They bring market structure, they bring reach, but they don't lose their soul. And you never see a lot of brands dying from those guys. Well, let's face it, the Bordelais are pros at it, at making us feel like we need to and have to experience the Ducru du Bucayou and those places of things, right? I mean, that's Well, just... and uh, when J Joseph Phelps got uh, purchased, for example, yeah. had some people being upset because it's an American iconic brand going to an international right. French group. But the other, the counterbalance of that, it's an international luxury group that now is going to promote a Napa Valley winery, historical, throughout the world. That's fascinating, actually, a, a viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Napa can always use the exposure in, in yeah, it's, particularly internationally. It's very good between, when you're between uh, yeah. uh, Louis Vuitton and Krug. Yeah, right. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be all right. <laughs> but it's, so th that dynamic, I think, in the wine industry is important. Is that the, is that the, is that the Moexis group too? Is that where he's at? I just did, I went uh, to a L tasting. LVMH, yeah, uh, Moetensi. I just went to a tasting, it was Roterer, Christian was there. I got to Mwex, shake his yeah. hand, Moex. Uh, Mouton was there. I mean, it was amazing tasting. Yeah, they bring... It cost me a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the branding that we're talking about. And it's, it's a an larger important scale. feature. And it's important um, tightrope. And I, I had a conversation with the CFO at Cheval Blanc as well, and the same exact question. And he goes, it's, it's a challenge. We have to have people understand that this is Cheval Blanc. This is the vintage of Cheval Blanc. But at the same time, we're trying to express what we are given, that vintage. And that's that's a tough one. Instead of, and here's an interesting scenario. You just brought it up with the, with the consumers. I was out at the market, the regular supermarket, and of course, it's all the same stuff, right? And the woman came, and she knew who I was for Little League or something. I forgot I coached her kid. But she didn't recognize me right away. And she said, and I was playing with the wines, and she says, um, I go, what are you looking for? She said, something other than I drink every day. I go, what yes. do you drink? She says, J. Lore. I'm like, okay, well, here's some wines that are, she didn't buy anything I recommended, even though she knew I spent most of my life in the wine trade, and she didn't buy anything. And it told me what an emotional decision it is for the consumer to decide this and figure yes. out and, and gamble a little bit. And I, it is a gamble and it is uh, getting out of the comfort zone. You know, a lot of people think there is a lot of afterthought in wine purchasing, but usually you're stuck between picking up your kids at school yeah, exactly. and, you know, what happening at work and, right. oh, shit, I need to go get food and you need a bottle of wine on the way. Yeah. And that's usually about the time, the decision time. Yes. And a lot of... You reach for the same thing. Well, and a lot yeah. of... The people in the stores have, you know, you, I mean, you, you get the employees that have worked with the wines that can give you good, but it takes time. And, and you don't, I don't, I don't yeah. want to grab that. I, I, I like my Chardonnay, you know, I'm going to drink the same thing. I drink Kendall Jackson. Yeah. It's okay, no problem. And they won't tell it to you because they're polite. And yes. Sometimes you don't even <laughs> realize it, but they don't have the time. And I mean, luxury here is that people come to try wines. So yes. They come and... They'll say, hey, I'm going to spend two hours with you learning about your wine. 
than trying your wines, but it's a conscious effort. Uh, when when you're most of the wine is sold, you know, to be drunk that day in the stores. Pretty much. And people walk in. Their number one priority is to walk out. Right. Yeah. So how do you make the decision? How do you help them do that quick decision? And you at the same time bring them a little bit of knowledge. Well, then what you do is you put a shelf talker for every wine there is in the store so that when you walk into the aisle, you're blinded by red and yellow. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and we don't and, read that. And much. scores, and you don't read that much. <laughs> that's where the scores come <laughs> that's in. That's the scores come in, and they have a, they have a score. But that's can a, read 95 and 96 yeah, a lot right. faster than those shelf talkers. And I bet people decide, like, it's one point better, I'm going to get that one when you know it doesn't oh, matter. That, uh, yeah. Totally. It, it makes a difference. It's an important thing. We're already at, she's already at 50 minutes. This is unbelievable. Um, but I did want to talk briefly about packaging because it is part of the consumer trend and you've got a low alcohol wine here, but it's, it's not like it's de-alcoholized wine, which no. I think it's uh, naturally, which produced. I don't understand myself why you would drink wine that's been de-alcoholized because none of them are any good just to make it look like you're drinking wine, but whatever. But there's this, there's this movement towards it's, and I think it's part of this generation change. One of these ebbs and flows that we have to suffer through the industry Canned wines, Tetra packs, alternative packaging. Mm -hmm. And I had a conversation, I've brought this up many times on the show with a Cornell professor recently, whose job it is to extend the life of a canned wine to 24 months from six. Yes. And I thought, how disgusting, just out of the shoots, the idea is that we have something can't line in these wines, uh, cans that can't uh, su support the acid or whatever is yep. eating away at it. Because yes. Coke, Coke's been in the can forever, and it doesn't bother those linings, but wine does. Yes. Wine is actually very, very aggressive. And the, and then also we have the idea of thinner, lighter, lighter bottles. Are you doing anything with these things, and if, what do you think of them? Yeah, so um, the weight of the glass, I think, will be the number one driver of uh, being more green. Yeah. Uh, in the whole chain, because you save on glass, so you save on energy to make it, you save on weight. You save on shipping, you save on a lot of stuff. I mean, you take a ball of Lafitte or a ball of Margot and you- It's five pounds. Yes. I know. <laughs> no, they are tiny, they're light. They're, they're lighter now? Light. Oh, they made them lighter. No, um, what happened, I mean, that's a Napa one where the heavier, the more expensive. Yeah, right. You have those balls where you don't know if it's empty yeah, or you're it's right. full. Yeah, you're right, Lafitte's a regular claret bottle. Yeah, it? no, it's, it's a really cheap wine. It's yeah. a really cheap glass. Uh, it's a very expensive bottle, but yeah. the glass doesn't matter technically. So there is a presentation. If I gift you a bottle that is two pounds heavier, you'll be like, ooh, it's a nicer gift. So I True. understand that trend, but people don't, uh, don't understand yet there's a packaging effort. Uh, what we've done internally is we removed wood. Uh, we went for pulp, for example. We went for cardboard. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Michel found a factory, local factory that does all the tissue wrap. I mean, you could just get rid of the tissue wrap. Um, some people get rid of the foil. Uh, I think at some point it's like you have to acknowledge that you're using and you're doing things that are not necessary, mm -hmm. or not prime mm -hmm. needs. Mm -hmm. um, so doing a nice ball, doing a nice packaging is important. And the cost associated to that is just how do you do it as green as possible um, in, in the choice you make. Um, the shipping in the US is developing. Um, we've seen a lot more solutions coming better solutions, more affordable, but it's still usually expensive and vastly complicated. It's ridiculous. I know. It's a big country. I was actually pretty legal. I shipped the 42 states. Well, that's another, yeah, but the, that's the, the legal store. part is another. But now the companies that, the guy that bought me only ships, you know, he only pays taxes in two states. I don't know how he gets away with it, but well, no, right. it, What would be interesting is um, the CO2 bill of the taxation yeah. and the licensing yeah, yeah. of the wine industry. I don't know. If I'm that's wondering like... if it outweighs the truck. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Probably. <yeah. laughs> that's a good question. That would yeah. be interesting, Matt. To when do. people used to come in like, oh, look at this bottle. I'll go, you know what that says to me? It says five pounds. I got to ship that. And I, I can only charge for three pounds. It's costing me a fortune to do that. But at the same time, when I got a flat bottom glass and go, how cheap does this look? And maybe the consumer just learns this. No, at some point, I think there is there is a presentation. There's a packaging send object. Yeah, um, you have you have to do that. But I think the perception will be also a little bit beyond just the bottle. Yeah. And then if you have a brand, 
it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's true. Just don't put it in a can. Well, that's a different. Hey, well, we've been we've already got fifty five minutes. It was an incredible conversation. I hope we can do it again. Oh, yeah. Is it is a chapter? And my goal in, is to do one in, entirely in French. I'm not there yet, but I'm, that's my goal. So <laughs> it'll be harder for the listeners. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yes. So Thank title. You <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again and cheers. Yes. Take care. Nice meeting you. My Take pleasure. care. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul, Callum, Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers.